welcome to this afternoon session. Um, my name is Angela, Angeloni Di Giulio. I'm the new chairperson of the, the joint consortium starting now. Um, I work with CONCERN, so, um, but representing here today the consortium. Um, I think probably most of you in the room are kind of familiar with the consortium, but it's a consortium. Um, I was going to just, all the logos are here. Oops, back. <coughs> Lost it. Uh, anyway, all the, consor all, all the members of the consortium, of which there are 12, are, are, are represented here today. And um, one of the main aims of the consortium is to share learning on, on gender-based violence, and particularly on prevention and response to gender-based violence around the world. So one of the initiatives we have is a, a learning and practice group, which is all about trying to gather best practice and discuss and learn and share that practice among our members and more broadly. So today's event is really another example of us wanting to share um, experience and learning and we've, we've some really, really um, exciting speakers here today to give us the benefit of their experience, um, particularly around engaging men in this whole area. So without any further introductions, I think I'm going to just hand over to Deirdre, who's going to explain who the speakers are and kind of the agenda for the afternoon. So thank you and welcome. Thank you very much, Angela. Um, my name is Deirdre Healy and I'm the current chair of the Learning and Practice Group. I work with Cambridge Development Studies Centre, but as uh, today I'm here as the, the chair of the Learning and Practice Group. We was, w just want to welcome you all very much. Um, you would have seen on re registration that we have produced a number of learning briefs. Um, from our various learning events. Um, we'll be producing another one from today, which will circulate to you all. But please, please feel free to take as many of the resources on the table outside as you would like. Um, we've been just asked to remind you that this is actually a working office. And I know it's, it, it's, it's a, a little bit difficult, but when you're outside the room, when, the, when we have the coffee break, can you just keep that in mind a little bit? Um, no singing, basically. Um, we are going to be videoing today for our website, um, again, so that we can have, actually have a, share the learning as widely as possible, and I hope that's okay with you all. We don't want this to inhibit your, your participation in, in the day, so please um, do ask as many questions as you'd like. Loads of seats at the front. Don't you love that? <laughs> we, have, uh, we do um, organise a number of events th throughout the year. In December, we, um, f we showed the film Mulade in the Lighthouse Cinema in a partnership with Kidwa, and we'll be doing lots of similar events. So do keep an eye out for us. We, we are going to be doing more regular events um, throughout the year. I would just like to... Um, I'm not quite sure Sarah might come to my... Rescue. Oh. Huh. Yeah. Okay, this will just gives you um, an outline of the day. And first of all, we have, and uh, we are thrilled, absolutely thrilled, to have Gary Barker here with us today. And he's the, the director of the Gender Violence and Rights Team for the International Centre for Research on Women and leads the organization's research program portfolio in, on engaging men and boys in gender equality. Before, before joining the ICRW, um, Gary worked for 10 years as a founding executive director of uh, Promundo, a Brazilian non-government organization that works to promote gender equality and reduce violence against children, youth, and women. He's also uh, produced a lot of mat uh, training materials um, and is, I think, going back to work with Pomando shortly. Yeah. Is that yeah. correct? Um, and then we're also really delighted to have Ernesto with us, and I've been given special permission just to use his first name because I can't pronounce the rest of it. <laughs> <laughs> Very bad. And he's here, um, he's a researcher and lecturer in the Women's Studies Centre in the School of Social Justice in UCD, and he teaches a, a course on men, masculinity and equality, and global health inequalities. And we'll also have Tendai Modondo from uh, Christian Aid in the after, uh, after the break, um, talking about practical experiences of Christian Aid, and she's the advisor on GBV and HIV. So without further ado, as they say, we will um, continue with Gary. Um, first of all, thanks to the consortium for the invitation, and thanks in particular to Sarah for organizing all of these details. Um, I just came in on the flight this morning, so if I nod off, please someone you know, poke me or something to make sure that I 
stay on, but I um, wanted to spend the weekend at home since I spend too much time traveling and um, my partner and daughter do hold me accountable for the stuff on male involvement that I stay involved at home as well. Um, I'm pleased to share with you all some data that we have and I'll go into the details about where it's coming from of a multi-country study called the International Men and Gender Equality Survey or Images which is actually going to be officially launched um, next week so you all will be sort of a rehearsal group of telling me does this data make sense and um, helping see if the presentations work and if um, the concepts behind it are clear. But what I want to do is talk about what we understand about the factors, the underlying causes, what men themselves are telling us about campaigns, laws, their experiences around the use of violence as well as the factors associated with that violence. Um, as uh, you heard in the introduction, my experience comes out from doing direct program work for a number of years in Brazil and elsewhere. And my interest in, in this data is figuring out how can we take those kinds of small level community-based approaches and experiences and try to turn up the volume. How can we take those and turn them into impact at the policy level? Because certainly we've got lots of small examples, very important ones, but unfortunately still far too small at the community level around engaging men. But what do we know about some of these bigger factors and what does that tell us about engaging men that we could then take to the policy level or somehow trying to scale up this work? Um, so in thinking about what I wanted to talk about today, one just a little bit of what do I mean or what do I think we mean as we talk about men and masculinities. What do we know about some of the factors that contribute to men's use of violence against women? Um, what have we tried at the program level? What seems to work? What kind of data do we have or evidence of impact of those programs? And then the big question that drives me and keeps me up late at night and traveling far too much is this. How do we go from these small scale interventions to a bigger scale? How do we drive this and put it into public policy? Um, so just, we're gonna hear more from Ernesto, so I won't spend too much on this, but just as we've been talking about masculinities and doing research about it, these are some of the key points for us. One, that we're talking about understanding men not as a monolithic, um, one-size-fits-all um, way of understanding what men are, but that there's a mul multiplicities out there, and that these multiplicities don't mean that some men are tall and some are short and some like blue and some like yellow, that there are different ways of being men. There are different categories of being men that hold more power than other categories of men, and that those power dynamics are the important things to understand, both in terms of men's lives as they interact with women, but also men's lives as men interact with other men. Um, we understand these versions, these ways of being men as constructed collectively in a number of social institutions from the household and the family to school to the workplace to community level to sports, et cetera, et cetera. And I suppose if there's any single universal that we hear as we listen to men around the world, it's this equation of being men and being adult men with being providers and having work. And we know all kinds of things, and I'll talk more about that, of what happens when men don't have as much work or as much income as they think they should. We understand that as we look around the world, that the rigidity around what it means to be men too often brings costs in the lives of men themselves and certainly in the lives of women that we see far too often. One of the things that I often question, and I think one of, I think Ernesto's um, advisor, actually Richard Parker, is who helped me think about it in this way, is to, too often our research makes it look like we, we focus the spotlight on a group of men in a given setting, and we say men there are like this. And they look like frozen pictures in many ways. It looks like the men are like that, they will be like that always, and there's nothing much that can be done, kind of a frozen picture of what men are, as opposed to understanding men in the dynamic nature of their lives, of what it means to be men changing over the life cycle, changing in cultural moment, changing in historical moment, and that if we can figure out ways that our programs can understand that ongoing sense of change, the tensions around being men, and not trying to sort of place men in these boxes, because those boxes actually are part of the problem after all. So I think as I talk about the research that we're looking about men, I think it's important to understand those dynamic tensions going on. And I think ultimately a piece that we don't talk about a lot as we talk about patriarchy and a structure that gives men more power collectively over women, 
Um, we don't often talk about or talk about as much the fact that patriarchy also creates huge power dynamics within men's lives, that some men have more power than others, and particularly the men that we're mostly working with in the Global South do not perceive themselves as powerful, even though we know that on paper, in lots of different ways, more than paper, they do <laughs> hold more power than the women in their lives. But to understand that where the men, as we, as we hold that view of them, they often don't have that view of their own lives. And to understand that sense of powerlessness that many men feel, particularly in the Global South, particularly low-income men, that the, the, that sense of frustration of feeling less power than other groups of more powerful men is often what drives a lot of men's use of violence and a lot of the negative behaviors that we're very much trying to change. So that's my masculinities 101. Nesta will go much more into to some of those points, but at least to say, as I'm using those terms masculinities and as I'm presenting some additional findings, that's kind of where I'm starting from. Um, I mentioned before this issue of kind of the, the hanging, the meaning of masculinity on the issue of work. And I think as we, if we turn on the microphone with young men, if we listen to adult and young men in many parts of the global south and say, what's on your mind? What's the biggest worry in your life? Often the first thing that will come up is the issue of work. And particularly in this <coughs> moment of global economic strife, um, this issue of economic stress comes up again and again. And I think that's one of the issues that um, we're beginning to look at and un trying to under unpack that and understand what it means in terms of what kinds of program or policy interventions should flow from an understanding of this. As we listen to the, the, the global south and basically the world overall as we look at the demographic structure, we're just coming out of kind of being the youngest that we think the planet will be. Um, this huge youth wave as we know in the global south depending on which country you're in, between 25 to 30 percent of the population is in this range that we call youth. And that's the, that's the biggest, we're just coming out of this youth wave, but it's the biggest youth cohort that the planet has seen, basically. So you've got lots of young women and young men searching for space to have work, to have expression, to have identity, to have a space at the table together with adults who control what happens in most of their lives. Um, trying to say, hey, I'm here, I exist, I want to be an adult at the table. For young men, what we often see is this frustration around, if I don't achieve work, if I don't have access to property, to land, um, I don't get access to the possibility of getting married and forming a family, and if you don't have all those requisites, in many parts of the world, you're not recognized socially as an adult man. <laughs> Um, and so we see lots of young men in many parts of the Global South feeling that they're stuck in this perpetual youthhood and kind of a sense that they're waiting for their space at the table. And a lot of frustration, particularly toward in different parts of Sub-Saharan Africa, will often hear the references to the big men. And young men quite angry about the big men who they see holding power, not always using it in very just or fair ways. A lot of pessimism that they'll ever make it to the table, so to speak and lots of negative behaviors that we see spinning out of that, particularly fatalism and particularly building in or providing, so to speak, a lot of young men ready to take up arms as happens too often in a number of the conflict settings that we're looking at around the world. And just to give you one snippet of the data set that I'm gonna be drawing from, and maybe I'll, I'm not sure if folks can see below the table there. Um, that's kind of, if you need to stand up and stretch. <laughs> To look, this is one of the questions that we ask in the International Men and Gender Equality Survey. I'll go into the details of where the survey came from, but from five of the countries, Brazil, Chile, Croatia, India, and Mexico, we asked men, regardless of income status and regardless of employment status, if they had ever experienced stress or depression as a result of not having enough work or enough income. And these are the percentages that come out between a third of Brazilian men to close to 90% of men in Mexico said that they had ever experienced this stress. Um, and this was regardless of at the moment they were currently employed or if in fact they had had fairly stable employment. Um, but I think it does give you a sense of just the degree to which um, one of the things that's foremost on men's mind is do they have enough income and enough work to be socially recognized as providers and as men.